Welcome to the Free Will Science and Religion Podcast. I'm Trick Slattery, and I'm here with George Ortega and Jamie Soden. And today we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the hedonistic imperative and how it drives our decisions to uh, drives us to make the decisions that we make. So, uh, George, what do you say about the hedonistic imperative? What what is what is first explain what it is and tell us a little bit about um, what it does exactly, what, okay. what its function is. Okay, I just want to correct the term a bit. Basically, like it's, it's actually called the hedonic imperative. Okay. It, it's really a, a term I coined um, when I published, well, actually when I was doing my, my, um, my TV show, and it's really a, a reiteration of the pleasure pr principle. You know, Freud and other psychologists other biologists just you know basically in the on the sciences there's this principle that organisms not just human beings seek pleasure and avoid pain okay so yeah. like so hedonic means like related to pleasure and pain so so and so it's you know relative to this question of whether we have a free will if we're hardwired to always you know do or think uh, what we predict you know, it's not always like a lot of times our predictions are wrong, but what we predict is going to bring us more pleasure, more happiness, then that that in itself, without invoking causality or nature or nurture in a certain sense, although it isn't genetic, I guess, that kind of like just shows how free will is impossible. And what would you say about people that act altruistically in the sense that what they do is they kind of sacrifice their own happiness for the happiness of another? What would you say... How does that get into this? Uh, this imperative? that's a good question. All right, like I think a lot of people might, let's say, prefer sensory pleasures, like being comfortable, feeling good, you know, just physically and whatever, just feeling pleasure. Well, people who who are very altruistic, people like Mother Teresa and all, what they do is they will, it, it gives them more pleasure to satisfy their conscience, you know. Right. They're, Exactly. So it's it's really a different form of pleasure, and maybe maybe a higher form of pleasure. Right. Right. So so it's not really it's not necessarily pleasure doesn't necessarily imply that someone is really experiencing uh, joy, for example, but they might be experiencing something, um, a desire, I guess, would be a, a maybe a better word. So they're they're desiring um, to help somebody else out, and it's that desire that that we can say is. Uh, is the pleasure? Is yeah, that, and would that one be other, correct? exactly. One other way to see it is like we've got competing motivations or desires: the desire to feel really good at the time, or desire to be good, to do something good. So, like whatever motivation or desire is the strongest, our strongest preference is going to be what we do. And again, that's another way. Our, our strongest preference, always deciding what we do, is another way of, of, of understanding why our free will is impossible. Okay, and, and Jamie, wh how about you? Do you do you uh, ever feel this uh, this imperative to do what is giving you pleasure? And and if so, how does it apply to your life? You think uh, it applies to well our everyday life. We do things that we um, feel that benefits us, or what seems to make most sense to us at the time. You know, we do we do things. Um, you know, like you say, it's the hedonic in princ uh, principle. You know, we go we go towards like uh, things that that are necessary to us, you know, or that we feel that's necessary to us. Right, right. Hmm. So the so it's hedonic principle, not hedonistic. Right, because uh, hedonistic. I mean, hedonism actually that's really a, a misappropriation of the Greek term. I mean, the the Greeks they you know there were some philosophers that they 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 were called the hedonists. Right. And basically, they appreciated pleasure. There was nothing really unethical about how they stated it, but then it got reinterpreted in, in modern lives to kind of like to denote, um, you know, seeking pleasure in irresponsible ways, in ways that are just like you know morally reprehensible or unhealthy. Ah, uh, yeah, because that that was the kind of the question I had because um, when I hear the word hedon, hedonistic or whatever, or even hedonic. I, I get the impression of kind of an egoism, kind of a um, doing what is best for you and not necessarily doing what is best for everybody else. Um, so I, I, that's that's why the word kind of concerned me a little. But but I, I do understand that people actually do what they 
what they desire to do. Like if if I was going to jump on a hand grenade, it's it's because that I actually desire to prevent the hand grenade from killing off the other people. It's it's something that that is within me that I want to happen. I so so I do understand that. So it's, but it, but it, but it's kind of um, I'm just trying to try to make the distinction between that and. That is an extreme example, though. I mean, I well, mean, no, I, yeah, no, that isn't. Yeah, it's a very yeah. extreme example. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just saying, uh, like, um, people doing things that, like a sociopath would path might do what is most pleasurable to them, but at the same time, that mm. that is nece- isn't necessarily what's best for society. So I I, I just yeah. kind of want to uh, yeah. see where the line is. <laughs> With, exactly, because like with our happiness in general, you know, our seeking happiness, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to seek it in ethical ways or moral ways. So, oh, of course, yeah, a sociopath will seek it in a way that you know is suitable for them, but not necessarily beneficial to other people. Like well, uh, they get off on the pain of others, don't they, sociopaths? Yeah. Right, which is interesting, Jamie, because like something else that the Greeks kind of like developed was this idea. It's very similar to the hedonic imperative that I I think I termed kind of like the moral imperative. That basically what what a lot of Greek philosophers said is at the time we're doing anything, and that might include being very sadistic, very you know sociopathic, whatever. We are rationalizing it. We're saying to ourselves we're doing something good because that person deserved it. Because like things aren't fair. We'll we'll say something to in our minds you know convince ourselves that what we're doing is actually the right thing. So that yeah. that's another that's another imperative. We're, we seem to constantly do that also. Yeah. And that, but would you that say things like revenge would be like sociopathic because people feel justified. You know, they feel morally justified in getting vengeance on someone who hurt them or their friends or whatever. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in regards to how this plays out within the realm of ethics, uh, since we we're kind of kind of leaning that in that direction there, um, would you say that? Uh, Understanding the hedonic imperative kind of allows us to um, work with causality to make people, oh, I guess, um, psychologically want the thing that is ethical. So, so in other words, we, we kind of need to play to uh, the hedonic imper- imperative in a way that makes people be ethical or act ethically. Um. Yeah, I mean that that's kind of like a different concern. I mean, I think we're we're kind of like, you know, refuting. We're trying to lead the world away from this free will perspective, this free will belief because as as Jamie was saying, it it leads to like our judging others as doing something wrong and then seeking retribution, wanting to punish them because we attribute free will to them, you know, and, and believe they they deserve to be punished. So so yeah, I think what we're doing trick is like we're we're kind of like making it easier more more logical for people to be happy or seek pleasure in moral ways by by interpreting reality in the right way by not attributing you know blame to, to other people that they're actually you know fundamentally innocent yeah right. Right. i think the, yeah. i think the right word what we need for to stop wrongdoing to deter like crime or whatever the word we need is i think it's I think you would use the word discipline because I said this the other day to Gary, you know, um, we're not, we won't use retribution in the sense that we'll, you know, kill the killer for, you know, killing innocent people, but we would certainly lock them up in jail and say, look, if you, you know, go and do these things, this is going to be your punishment, you know. Yeah, and that gets more into the whole deterrence thing, yeah. uh, why, we, why we need to do something to deter people. Uh, Especially if they aren't the most rational. So, right, you know, yeah. we're trying to get people to that rational model where where they understand that free will is an illusion, and they understand that that pretty much no person is more or less deserving than another person of of uh, the worst of the that they get or the be- or the best. So, we need to kind of it, it's more of a balancing act that we're trying to play out here, and. Um, when it comes to the hedonist or the hedonic, hedonic narrative, right. I cannot get that straight. <laughs> Hedonistic, hedonic. Um, 
I think uh, yeah, that plays that def- definitely does play into it. Uh, the psych, it's 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 playing into the psychology of people basically. So yeah, again, yeah. you know, like if we're always like seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, that's like that's programming. Let's let's say that we use the analogy if we're like we created a, a robot that could move, and every time it, it encountered a wall. It made a left turn instead of a right. You know, it, it encounters an obstacle or wall. You know, it could make a left or a right turn, but we program it to always make a left turn each time it hits that obstacle. It's the same thing. If we're programmed to every time we have a decision about what to do, to, 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 to try to, to predict what we believe is going to make bring us the most happiness or the most pleasure, that's the same kind of programming that would apply to the robot. So, like again, like just that, how we see that the robot has no choice but to make a left. We have no choice but to do what we believe is going to bring us more pleasure or happiness. Right, right. And, and like you said, what we mean by happiness is is isn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to be um, some blissful state. I guess it, it could be some psychological happiness. Uh, that's something else, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Just satisfying our conscience. Satisfying our conscience. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense there. Um, yeah. Well, the reason why you'd make like a sacrifice to save another, like like with your grenade example, is because you feel um, it's the morally right thing to do to uh, say protect a child from the frag grenades or whatever. You know, so you'll jump on it and try to. Absorb some of the explosion, whatever, but you'll get killed in in the process, obviously. Yeah. Right. So it's it's not. Yeah. yeah. So so I mean that 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 that's where it gets a little tricky because it's not necessarily uh, obviously you being dead isn't going to make you the most happiest, but to your own psychology, that was your best option. That was, I right. guess, the right. Most and you you got to realize, trick. I mean, like you know. Here in the United States, 80, 90 percent of, of people believe in a higher power and I think believe in heaven. So, so a lot of people are thinking, oh, I'll throw myself on a grenade and do a noble, courageous thing and be rewarded with eternal happiness in heaven. Ah, that's a good point as well. Yeah, if you bring up their whole religion thing, then it's not that, uh, yeah, the death that part isn't as important as the happiness you'll find in heaven as well. So people might, might be doing that as well. Yeah, hmm. it's very interesting. Yeah, it would get quite quite messy to them because you know most of their bodies made of water, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the hedonic imperative. Um, what else uh, would you say on this, George? Is there any anything else you you have? Well, yes. I mean, let's talk more about imperatives. There's an all there. You know, we talked about the hedonic imperative. Then, like, there's kind of like a moral imperative. We're gonna like do what we at the time believe is right. There's another imperative that's like the reason imperative or the logic imperative. You know, we're not gonna do what doesn't seem reasonable. You know, the the example I usually use is like there's two glasses of wa- glasses before us. And we want to like empty the the contents of of a pitcher or something into one of them, and we see that one of them is not going to hold the contents, but the other one will. Our logic will compel us to pour the, the liquid or the water into the larger glass. So we mm. apply that to everything. If something doesn't make sense, you know, we're kind of like hardwired to do what makes sense to us. Though I see some people uh, it, that's not as important, and and and. We need to work towards them, uh, f- towards the hedonic imperative, towards them leading to the reason imperative. In other words, uh, some people reason reason doesn't isn't what gives them the most pleasure. It's it's um, it's other things, uh, faith faith, for example, uh, or or just community or or emotions. Uh, these are things that that give them the pleasure, and that I don't think that necessarily equates to um, the reason imperative, though I think the reason imperative is uh, is is more important. So I I'm trying to see how we can work toward uh, using the hedonistic or the hedonic imperative. Sorry, towards to lead towards the more reasonable imperative. What do you say about that? I agree with you. In other words, like while we while our default, you know, I think uh, motivation is generally to be reasonable. 
uh, a lot of times our emotions will kick in, our, our, our desires and all. And actually, this is like what we're up against with the free will question. You know, a lot of philosophers, PhDs who have been studying this for years, if not decades, their, their need, their psychological need to believe either that they're in control of things or that, like, that, you know, we have this personal morality, whatever they're, they have these personal emotional, I think, needs to see life in a, in a certain way, that prevents them, that, that hijacks or trumps their reasoning. So, you, so you're right, Trick. We have to come up with ways to get them to derive more pleasure from understanding that free will is an illusion than from, like, denying it and, and subverting their reason. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so I'm thinking that, that the hedonic imperative is probably a stronger imperative than the reason imperative, at least for, for some people. <laughs> so that's the way I see it anyway. And, and to get, we need to get people to move to the reason imperative. And, and I, don't know, I don't know the best ways to do that personally. You, I mean, you get takes on the best ways? Yeah. We need to get more people like, um, on board with this rehabilitation stuff because um, on some offenders it can work, you know. Yeah. Yeah, actually like there is a this guy Chris Mooney, he's a science writer. He a couple of years ago or so wrote this book called The Republican Brain and he also like basically his the basic thesis, he just went through the literature and just cited all this research that most people think that like for example our political opinions, our opinions about social issues and all that we form these based on what seems logical and rational. And what all this research has discovered is, no, we, we form our beliefs not based on what, what makes sense, what, you know, on the data and all. We base this, these, these beliefs on what we need to believe. And, you know, he called it the Republican brain because, like, apparently Republican conservatives do this more than liberal Democrats and all. But, but everybody really does this. And, and so, Trick, so, like, uh, we have to balance this. In other words, like... Part of what we do, I think, has to be to really explain the, 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 the solid, irrefutable logic of free will being impossible, but we also have to cater to their emotions. In other words, like, you know, again, some of these philosophers, they've, been, they've, been, they've written books on this, you know, and they still get the, the answer wrong. So, like, so again, we have to appeal, we have to also, like, appeal to their emotional needs to help them, you know, to help them have their reasoning you know, consider the evidence. Right. And, and in some way, I, I'd, I'd say it's probably an uphill battle because we have all these biases that people have, like confirmation bias, optimism bias, even pessimism bias. So, so all these different biases bombard people um, without them even knowing. Uh, and, and we need to move people away from the bias and get them to look at things from more of a observer perspective where they're looking down on the world and they're just looking at the facts and that's what I'm not sure how, how Real, we go about doing realistic yeah yeah um, like Jamie you're talking about like you know sometimes we're unfair to people because we blame them because our free will belief we have this like this 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 bias toward seeking retribution seeking justice and all and it's conditioned it's conditioned you know generation after generation so we have to find ways to, to help people like value fairness and compassion and empathy more than they value you know just desserts and, and revenge and all yeah it's like um, people like with different like you know mental illnesses and pe people just um, get the wrong impression about some of them like you know they, they assume oh um, they're psychotic they're likely to offend and not in all cases this is what I try and tell people and Trick Slattery knows this and I gave him a sent them some proof about it before um you know just some people just blame people for what they think about you know it's just it's just right wrong. and trick you're right this you know um a, a perfect example is evolution you know i think darwin proposed it what it was the, like 1860s something like that exactly and yeah. here we are like you know over 150 years beyond that and still half of americans believe in creationism so like some of these beliefs yeah. are very tough to shake yeah 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 they believe in creationism and they deny evolution so which is you know has the has mounds and mounds and mounds of 
upon mounds of evidence. It's, it's probably our most uh, strongest scientific finding. So, yeah. Um, so what else? Uh, so we went over confirmation bias. We went over biases and and the problems with uh, with what people. Um, Just basically having bias and not being able to get to the, the point of the reason imperative. Um, and we're trying to work out solutions to that. Uh, any other ideas on re regarding solutions? Well, again, like, you know, um, in politics a lot, you know, here in the United States, Republicans win a lot of elections not because they are right on the issues logically, but because, because they know they're wrong or maybe they don't, I don't know they will appeal to people's emotions. So we basically have to find ways, for example, like instead of telling people don't blame others because it, they're not really fundamentally responsible, you know, because it's wrong to do that because it doesn't make sense, we have to, our message has to be, listen, when you understand that you and, and everybody around you doesn't have a free will, that nobody has a free will, then you're going to feel much better not blaming them because like you know our relationships will improve and and like a lot of times we blame ourselves so we're going to feel much better so we have to really find messages that um that shift them that basically substitute the kind of pleasure they're having in either blaming or, or taking credit for stuff substitute that for a higher pleasure of like just like enjoying people more enjoying themselves more enjoying life more yeah and, yeah. and I think we can also kind of go into how um, how destructive blaming others is, and and how the world itself would be a better place if if everybody didn't blame each other, and how that would actually in fact affect them uh, hedonically. I guess that the world is a better place, right, Jamie? Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. Um, but one of the barriers is uh, I think people's religious faiths because. Um, you know, the belief in free will was important to, you know, people who believe in God and all this and that and the other. And um, I understand that it's hard to let go of, like, you know, old tradition and stuff. But at the same time, you have to acknowledge, you know, the truth, you know. Um, and it's not their fault, you know, they were, they were indoctrinated with these beliefs. Um, their families passed on old traditions to them and then they pass on their traditions to other people. You know, it's, it's like... Um, it's like Christmas, you know. People, um, you know, celebrate Christmas every year, and some some of them are not even Christians, you know. So, yeah, you know, yeah, so. that definitely. I mean, the whole religion thing is is a, is a yeah. a big obstacle for for us because uh, a lot of people think that uh, God gave them free will and all that stuff. So, we need yeah. to kind of work around that, and and it takes people a long, long, long time to to change a belief, especially something that's been indoctrinated since they're, you know, since yeah, they're born. Yeah, their mind, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what we have to understand. I mean, like, you know, it's going to take, you know, society years, if not several decades, to really, really get this. And, and I think we will. But, like, with the religion, for example, like, people are going to want to believe in God. And, like, so we actually use the logic that they believe that there's, that's part of their religious belief to, bas to basically contradict this 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 notion of free will for example if they define god as being all powerful then it's very very easy to make the argument to them well listen according to your belief if god is all powerful that means if he doesn't want you to do something there's no way you're going to do it and if he wants you to do something there's no way you're not going to do it so you know basically uh, using the beliefs and then the other thing is kind of like to make them feel good about this cuz like you know a lot of times people feel good oh I'm going about my ba my day doing what I will, what I want to do. And so, like, for religious believers, for believers in God, we say to them, listen, like, when you abandon this free will belief, you'll go around your days basically saying, well, I'm doing, I'm doing all this, what, I'm doing God's work, I'm doing God's will. And I think for a lot of people that'll, that, that's, that's actually a more positive evaluation of, of, of justifying their actions than just doing them because we want to. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, a, uh, I think, a fair stepping stone to the rational imperative that we're looking for, though, though I wouldn't say, say that 
that has hit the rational imperative, but it's uh, it's just you have to take small baby steps to get to that point, and I think that might be one of them. Yeah, you have to make examples to try and simplify it for him. Like, for example, um, a computer programmer, right, um, who makes a video game, uh, makes you know fictional characters of each with their, having their individual AI, uh, so they can walk around and in like a, a, an open world. Um, they have no free will, but um, they had a creator, you know. So you have to, you know, use that example um, with this God thing. If, if God created people. Um, you know, with the knowledge that they'll do something, um, then his creations cannot have free will. Yeah. Excellent example, Jamie. For example, let's say we, let's say we created a robot, right? And yeah. Through some magic, because it would have to be magic, <laughs> and we we gave that robot free will, and that robot went out and wreaked havoc, you know, in, in town, just destroyed stuff. So, so like, yeah. they get the robot, they get us. We're in front of yeah. a judge. I mean, yeah. like, who do you, who do you think the judge is going to punish? The, the robot or us? <laughs> of course. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah, and, th- and that goes kind of into the whole um, when a, a people who I think their God is a punishing God and you know will send them to hell or anything like that. It's <laughs> kind of it's kind of like um, us creating a robot that has a pain sensor and then programming it to destroy whatever, like your house or something, and then uh, when it does. Mm punishing it for that yeah <laughs> it's, it's, exactly. a, it's, it's an absurdity <laughs> oh yeah yeah and it's so like, like smashing a car for malfunctioning you know what i mean it's just right and so like yeah in terms of like you know people getting this trick i mean like we're gonna do a lot of the podcast we're gonna like reiterate these same points over and over and over because people need to hear this you know sometimes people need to hear this a hundred times or a thousand times before they can overcome their emotional you know, denial resistance to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for for me, it's it's a it's like a big psychological thing. It's it's made it's made me less angry. I definitely don't get angry hardly ever. You know, so even even when people do things that really would normally bother me, I can kind of get by it now because I understand that why they're why it's happening. It's through their causal mechanism, and and they didn't. They couldn't have done otherwise than what they're doing. So yeah. and when people start to realize that, they, they become more relaxed about things and they don't become uh, immediately angry. Yeah. People realize if you get angry about certain stuff, right, it's, all it's doing is it's, um, putting your health at risk. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, we should, we should do episodes basically based on my experience because I feel it too. You know, like when I see... These politicians saying these horrible things, whatever, on TV. You know, before I used to get personally angry at them and, and at groups of people. Now, you know, I'm very quick to remind myself, oh, my God, you know, they, it's not up to them. So I might <laughs> still get angry at, at the universe or God, but that's, that's a lot better than getting angry at people or, or ourselves. Yeah. yeah, I find that I get more frustrated than angry now. So, so it's, just a, it's just a frustration for the causal variables that happen. It's like, oh, why did those causal variables have to happen? It's just frustrating that, that rather than me being angry over it because it, I know it's not anything that could have happened otherwise. So, Absolutely. Yeah. It's like people end up arguing with, um, you know, for telling them that people are not to blame for their mental disorders and stuff, you know, psychological problems. It doesn't matter whether it's depression, like what I've, like what me and Felicia have got, or other psychological problems like, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, or whatever it may be. You know, they should not be blamed for an illness that impairs them to the point where they cannot right. work. Or yeah, and you're even getting into into mental illnesses or or, or illnesses that are actually uh, we we know of, but but even without the illnesses, people aren't to blame in that sense. So we kind of uh, we don't even have to go to the illness part of things. We can just say no. It's no matter what the person does, it, they had to do that based on their exactly. Uh, Guys, we got about set. we got less than thirty seconds. Okay. So how do you want to close this up, George? Well, I mean, like, I think, you know, let's remind the audience, we're going to be talking more and more about this, coming up with more and more examples of how overcoming the free will belief is going to benefit people personally and the world in general. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's it, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Thanks, Trick. Great show. Okay. Great show, guys. All right. Talk to you soon.